Alzheimer's disease will be a disease of the 21st century and that in the years to come, this will be a rare disease. We will look at Alzheimer's disease in the future the way we look at leprosy, the way we look at syphilis, the way we look at polio. Hi everyone, Drew Prode here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. In today's episode, we're talking all things Alzheimer's with Dr. Dale Bredesen. He's the author of the newly released book, The End of Alzheimer's Program. In that book, he helps us understand the end of this interview, he explains it, He talks about something that's very, very important for anyone who's concerned about their cognitive decline in the future, and that is this. All the latest emerging research and all of the work that Dr. Dale Bredesen is doing is showing that Alzheimer's is not have one cause. It has many causes, and if we're going to address it and deal with it, prevent it, and even potentially reverse cognitive decline, we have to address those multiple factors. That's what this interview is about today. It's for anyone that cares about aging gracefully, and it's for anyone that wants to know what you can do today at any age to protect your brain in the future. It's a fascinating interview. He truly is on a short list of people that I think are doing game-changing work. I'm excited to have him on the podcast. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast, where we dive deep into the topics of neuroplasticity, epigenetics, mindfulness, functional medicine, mindset, and more, all with the goal of helping you understand that your brain is not broken. I'm your host, Drew Proid, and each week, my team and I bring on a new guest who we think can help you improve your brain health, feel better, and most importantly, live more. This week's guest is Dr. Dale Bredesen. Dr. Bredesen is an internationally recognized expert in the mechanisms of neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease. And he's also the author of the New York Times bestseller, The End of Alzheimer's. He's held faculty positions at UCSF, UCLA, and the University of California, San Diego, and directed the program on aging at the Burnham Institute before coming to the Buck Institute in 1998 as its founding president and CEO. He's currently a professor at UCLA and the chief science officer at Apollo Health. His latest book, The End of Alzheimer's Program, goes on sale August 18th, so you definitely want to pick it up. In his book, he goes into greater detail on the protocol that he uses with his patients and how it can be tailored to anyone's needs at any age. And it's our topic of conversation today. Dr. Bredesen, Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. Thanks so much, Drew. Thanks for having me. So we're going to start off with something because some of our listeners are hearing about you for the first time. Even though your work has been out there, you have a best-selling book. I want to start off with some of the basics, and I want to ask you a question. You know, this is a question from uh, the investor and and venture capitalist and thinker who's a little bit controversial at times, especially because of his political leanings. But I think nonetheless, the question is a great question. The question goes, what important truth Do you know to be true that very few people agree with you on? That Alzheimer's disease will be a disease of the 21st century and that in the years to come, this will be a rare disease. We will look at Alzheimer's disease in the future the way we look at leprosy, the way we look at syphilis, the way we look at polio. And I think very few people believe that because they think, here's this thing that's just taken us over. This is now the third leading cause of death in the United States uh, after uh, cancer and heart disease. Uh, And they look at, look, there has been nothing. Uh, Pharmaceuticals have really not altered the course of this disease at all. And therefore, we're likely to have this as a major contributor. And in fact, it's on the rise. Uh, I think that that is incorrect because we now have such great hope. And this is one of the points I wanted to make. This is such an exciting time because we have spent decades looking at how neurodegeneration actually occurs. What are the molecular events that drive the process of neurodegeneration? And now translating those results into workable solutions we really see many, many people improve their cognition, reverse their cognitive decline. We've 
published on over a, uh, over 100 uh, patients who've done this. We now have thousands who are on the protocol that we developed, and it's continuing to improve. And let me give you a simple example here. There was a recent paper in which uh, researchers used artificial intelligence to look at DNA from the blood that was reflective of specific brain tumors. So you could actually see naked DNA. This was separate from cells circulating in the blood from those brain tumors. They did a very complicated methylation analysis, and you just mentioned epigenetics. So they looked at the methylation pattern, and they were able to show that you could actually pick up DNA in the blood from the brain tumors, and you could actually subtype the brain tumors very effectively by looking at their methylation patterns. But it took artificial intelligence to pick these out. So we've already started the process. We now have subtypes of Alzheimer's. We can tell you if it's more inflammatory in your case, if it's more atrophic, if it's more toxic, if it's more vascular. We can begin to tease these things out. But as we go forward, this will only get better and better and better as we get more follow-up data, as we apply artificial intelligence methods, we'll be able to enhance this. And this should be a rare disease. And as you already know, for people who are on prevention, you just don't see them convert into Alzheimer's disease. We see many, many people who are on prevention. We have not had any so far doing the appropriate protocol who have now converted and become demented. So this will be a disease of the past in the not too distant future. You know, you use an example in your book about uh, polio and some of the thoughts and stories that your mom used to tell you about yeah. polio and how you navigated it. Uh, can you talk about that analogy and share a little bit about that here in relation to uh, cognitive decline and uh, Alzheimer's? Exactly. And, you know, Alzheimer's will be a past scourge. And that was the point that I was making in the book. And yes, when I was a little kid growing up, uh, was the era right before Sabin and Salk vaccines were starting to come out. And so, yes, you know, people would just, you know, someone down the block would suddenly wake up paralyzed and, you know, people would die from polio. And so it was something that my mother, with a small child, was worried about. She thought, you know, what's the likelihood that my son is going to get polio? And so one of the things that came out at the time was, oh, maybe it comes from flies. That could be, that was the theory of the day. And so she told me as a little kid, now, okay, stay away from flies. And of course, again, you know, you're running around on playground, you're running through the woods, you're playing with your friends you know, impossible to stay away from flies. And of course, it turned out not too long after that, um, first the Salk and then the Sabin vaccines came out. And I remember the little sugar cubes from the, uh, from the Sabin uh, vaccine that came out. It was, you know, it was fantastic because like, hey, I was a little kid and I didn't have to get another shot. So I thought that was great. And so suddenly polio, and I think this is so interesting because it went from something that was a scourge that was uppermost on so many people's minds and which was just felling people at all ages, all the time, to something that virtually nobody had to worry about. And we're in that middle place right now where for the first time, something we didn't have 10 years ago, we can actually do something, not only prevention, but also reversal, but we have to do it the right way. We, the earlier you get in, the better, but we're seeing again and again and again, people stop worrying about Alzheimer's. So for the first time, we're seeing people lose their fear. And one of the things that really struck me was a woman who was at a meeting of APOE4.info. And this was a wonderful group of over 3,000 people around the world who are APOE4 positive and all concerned about their risk for Alzheimer's disease. And in the past, they had nothing to be done. And now virtually all of them are on some variation of the protocol that, that was developed a few years ago where you're now targeting the specific risk factors and the specific drivers of the decline, literally just translating this from the laboratory work. And so uh, a woman who was new to the group came in and, she, you know, whereas all of the other ones had these horrible stories and worries about their families and, and you know, terrible stories of people who had become demented, 
she was really kind of unafraid. And, and I said to her, well, you know, this is not seem to bother you. She said, no, because I see all these people who are on prevention. They're all doing great. I see people who've improved their cognitive status. So even though I just found out that I'm APOE4 positive, I'm not particularly worried. I know that if I do the right things, if I get on the right protocol, I shouldn't have to worry. And that was a fundamental change, just as we saw for polio, a fundamental change from a scourge to something that people were not worried about, to see people who are no longer concerned about this because they realize that this scourge is about to become a scourge of the past is really exciting. And so to continue on the polio example, yeah. one thing that gives you tremendous hope with the work that you do, because you're seeing it every day, but also how this applies to people who are facing cognitive decline or have fears of Alzheimer's is that unlike polio, it's not a single you know, thing that you're hoping that will be the fix for it, right? It's the understanding of something else, this idea of a silver buckshot. Can you talk about that with our audience? You know, that is such a good point because we have to change the way we think about medicine and health, and I know that that's a, a big part of your podcast. Um, the, the, uh, the whole point here is we've been taught that the way medicine works is that you wait for symptoms to occur and then you find a single agent that is causing the problem and then you use a drug to fix that. That's 20th century medicine. It worked well for things like tuberculosis, pneumococcal pneumonia. It has not worked for 21st century illnesses. Whether you talk about hypertension, which really, uh, you know, when you give an antihypertensive, you're actually skirting the problem. Uh, whether you talk about Alzheimer's disease, whether you talk about cancers, things like that. These are complex chronic illnesses. They are fundamentally different than simple illnesses of the 20th century. And therefore, we need to look at these very differently. And as you said, with polio, it turned out to be one simple virus and a, and a, and a rather simple vi uh, virus at that, a picoRNA virus, the polio virus. And so yes, with a, with a simple vaccine, you can prevent this. With Alzheimer's, there are dozens and dozens of contributors that all produce this problem. So, you know, it would be a little bit like if you looked at someone who had you know, leprosy and you biopsied them and said, oh yeah, there's, a, there's an inflammatory response here. If we just get rid of that inflammatory response, everything will be okay. But that's not how the disease works. You need to get to the root cause. And in this case, there are root contributors as opposed to a simple root cause. So you need to know if someone's insulin resistant. You need to know if they are, are glycotoxic. You need to know if they have ongoing inflammatory processes. Specific pathogens, as you know, have come up again and again and again. Herpes simplex type one, HHV6A, Epstein-Barr virus, P. gingivalis uh, uh, from the oral dentition, T. denticola. All these things are coming at these chronic pathogens, where instead of having an acute infection, you typically have a more chronic uh, infection. And this thing, the response to this is what we call Alzheimer's. So the, the innate immune system activation in the Alzheimer's process, you have a chronic activation of the innate immune system, but you have an ineffective response of the adaptive system. So you don't do a good job with handing off the pathogen and the response to the more adaptive, the cellular and the humoral response. And you're stuck with this chronic inflammatory process. And by the way, the amyloid that we associate with Alzheimer's in the brains of the patients with Alzheimer's is part of the innate immune system. It actually has an antimicrobial effect uh, as Robert Moyer and Rudy Tanzi from Harvard showed a number of years ago. So what and, and I just want to pause there because yeah. I think that's such an important point that you're making because so much of, you know, most people who are listening to this podcast who are familiar at all with some of the conversation around Alzheimer's, they've heard of the term amyloid plaque and they've often taught that it's a boogeyman, that it's the yeah. cause of it. And most of the drugs and the billions of dollars of research have been focused early on in the world of Alzheimer's around how do we prevent that amyloid plaque from happening? But what you're sharing here is that this isn't the boogeyman, it's actually part of the body's natural survival mechanism. If it right. didn't happen, we might actually face decline much earlier or potentially even death. Absolutely. It's, 
you know, it's like saying, look, you know, you, you just had a, you have a wound, something has cut you. And if you could just wipe away, get rid of the blood and get rid of the scab, everything's going to be fine. Well, no, you keep on knocking off the scab, you're going to keep on having bleeding problems. And that's exactly what's going on in Alzheimer's. You try to get rid of this amyloid. Well, the amyloid is there for a reason. So it turns out that, unfortunately, we were all wrong. Amyloid doesn't cause this disease. It is a mediator. It is a response to these various insults. So we have to adjust the way that we think, just as you were saying about polio. This is a different story. There are all these different contributors, so we need to start by identifying them. This old idea that, well, you know, you have dementia, there's not much, you're gonna look at your serum sodium and potassium and B12 and a few other things. You're missing 95% of what's actually going on. So you need to look at all the things that actually contribute to this problem. You need to root them out, basically, and then you need to address each of these. And when you do that, you literally change this balance so that you now are changing the signaling from pulling back synaptoclastic signaling to now going forward, which is synaptoblastic signaling. This is no different than what we talk about with osteoporosis, where you want to change from osteoclastic to osteoblastic. And same idea here. This is Alzheimer's is essentially synaptoporosis. So we now want to change that signaling. And when you do that, when you remove these various insults that are actually causing this imbalance, no surprise, people start to improve. And they are now once again able, as you said earlier, neuroplasticity. So this is about improving, unlocking the synaptoblastic side of the neuroplasticity. And to do that, you've got to get at what's causing. We've had some amazing examples recently, people who did some of the right things, but were still declining. And then it turned out that they had something that was unrecognized. In one case, major organic toxin that hadn't been picked up before. Once that was addressed, the person started to improve again. In other cases, it'll be specific pathogens that haven't been recognized before. Again, once they're addressed, people start to improve. And by the way, Drew, one of the things that's come out really commonly that we did not understand previously, how important it actually is, is uh, nocturnal oxygen desaturation. And there was a wonderful study that showed that if you simply look at the mean SpO2, so the mean oxygen saturation while you are sleeping, that is directly proportional to the volume of specific nuclei in your brain. So as you begin to fall with your oxygenation, and we see this all the time, where people didn't realize they're falling below the 96 to 98% percent that you'd like to see. Of course, we hear a lot about this with COVID-19, about oxygen saturation. But many of us are dropping while we sleep without having COVID-19. We're simply dropping because of sleep apnea or other reasons. UARS is another big one. But for whatever reason, we drop that saturation. We see people dropping not only to the low 90s, but into the 80s. And we've even seen people into the low 70s. Wow. This is starving your brain during that time. So in fact, you need to increase that. And one of the things that people find is they do better when they actually address this reduction in oxygen saturation while they sleep. And usually they don't look for it. So critical to do that as part of the treatment for cognitive decline or risk for decline. Incredible. And I want to go into some of those because you lay a lot of them out in the protocol inside the book in great detail for people to follow. But I want to take a step back. And, you know, we have people of all ages listening to this uh, podcast. Let's even start. You shared uh, some of the stats, but give us a few more of the global statistics and why it seems to be that when people talk about some of the scariest diseases, chronic diseases that are out there, why Alzheimer's often finds itself at the top of the list that's there. So what are the stats that we know, whether it's US or globally, about Alzheimer's and cognitive decline? It's a really great point. You know, um, so loss of cognition has replaced cancer as the number one worry of people as we age. And of course, we have an aging society. You know, the, the silver tsunami is upon us. Uh, those of us who are baby boomers, including myself, 
um, are all reaching uh, older age now. And this is a huge issue and is, of course, going to bankrupt Medicare within the next about 15 years um, if we don't do something about it. So this is a huge issue. And as you indicated, I mean, the statistics we hear are, are horrible. And in fact, the, the reality is even worse than the statistics. Here's, here's why. There are about 5.6 million Americans who have a current diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. But that is just the tip of the iceberg. My two daughters, for example, too young to know if they're going to get Alzheimer's yet. So let's ask the question of the current about 323 million living Americans. How many of us will die with Alzheimer's disease? Well, if nothing has changed, about 45 million of us currently living Americans will die of Alzheimer's disease. This is a huge problem. This is a trillion dollar global pandemic. And we've heard a lot about the pandemic COVID-19. Alzheimer's is killing far, far, far more than that. And of course, the two are actually linked because in fact, many of the same features that give us risk for Alzheimer's also give us risk for poor outcomes in COVID-19. It's just that COVID-19 has taken the decades long timeline of Alzheimer's and has compressed it into about two weeks. So yes, with obesity, we are at increased risk for both. Yes, with poor immunity, we are at increased risk for both. Yes, with low vitamin D, we are at increased risk for both. And on and on, type 2 diabetes, another critical risk factor for both. And of course, one of the major things that's coming out of the COVID-19 studies is that we all should be spending more time outdoors. As was pointed out, in the Wuhan studies, they found that every case they looked at had transmission indoors except one. So when they had these sudden bursts, these were all from people getting together indoors. Indoors is where the droplets are. It's where the duct work is, the air conditioning. It's much different. There's the lower humidity factor, which is more likely to transmit the viruses through the air. Exactly. You go outdoors, now things dissipate. And what's interesting is we see the same thing in Alzheimer's. Indoors is where the mycotoxins are. We build our homes out of mold food. So we are at increased risk when we spend more time indoors. Of course, indoors is where the refrigerator is. Indoors <laughs> is where the sedentary lifestyle is. Indoors is where the couch and the TV are. All of these things that are in you know, increase our risk. So we want to get out there. We want to get more exercise. We want to dissipate any uh, a potential for these various pathogens. So, um, so this is one of the things that's, that's coming out of here. Uh, and you know, again, these these things are all critical. We understanding this disease and understanding it better and better will make it so that this is truly a rare, rare disease, just as it should be. Mm. You know, inside of those stats that you've shared, one of the things that your work has really put the spotlight on is an understanding that just like you shared earlier that Alzheimer's isn't caused by one thing, so it's not going to be one thing that helps unravel it. There's also this idea that even though you don't have a diagnosis yet for Alzheimer's, you could be on your way. And so there's factors that are going on in your 30s and 40s and 50s, well before most people would be diagnosed with Alzheimer's, that can increase your risk of, of getting it. Talk to us a little bit more about that and how just because you don't have a diagnosis doesn't mean, you know, I think in the traditional public, people think like you either have something or you don't have something. Talk to us about how maybe that's not actually true. This is so important because, you know, it used to be thought you either had diabetes or you didn't have diabetes. And now we understand there's pre-diabetes. We understand that even before that, there's insulin resistance, etc. And the same thing is coming out here. And one of the points, one of the reasons that, uh, that I wrote the second book was because people would say, well, look, I'm not going to worry about this Alzheimer's disease of your 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. You know, I'm 35, I'm 40 or 45. Well, it turns out, in fact, that Two things have happened since then. Number one, it turns out it takes about 20 years from the beginning of the pathophysiology to reach a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So what we thought of in the past as a disease of the 60s, 70s, and 80s is really a disease of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. It's just that this plays out, you get the manifestations later on. But the second thing is, just as we have seen childhood obesity, child 
childhood type 2 diabetes like never before. We're seeing the same thing. There are people in their teens and 20s who are damaging their own ability to think, to do their best on various testing on the, in their school, etc., because of the fact that they have ongoing inflammation. They have ongoing things that haven't been addressed. Poor methylation, for example, that hasn't been addressed. Uh, unknown pathogens, chronic inflammation, various toxic exposure. And again, we see these, we make diagnoses, including things like Parkinson's from various toxins later in life. But when you're young, in fact, this can affect you. And therefore, we argue people should be looking into this early. If you've got a family history especially, you'll be surprised to see that in fact, your cognition will be improved and can be improved at any age. We, we recommend that everybody who's 45 years of age or, or older, just as you know, when you turn 50, you get a colonoscopy. When you turn 45, or if you're older than 45, please get a cognoscopy. It's, it's simple, and we go into the book how to do that. But even people who are in their teens, 20s, and 30s will find that they do better with more energy, addressing the same sorts of things that are actually down the road going to increase their risk for Alzheimer's disease. Let's talk a little bit origin story because I think the question that a lot of listeners have right now is that in the midst of all these stats, these overwhelming stats about Medicare going bankrupt, about the rate of cognitive decline increasing in society, the epidemic of Alzheimer's that there is there. You've been in the field of anti-aging for a while. At what point in your story did you start to see the first glimpses that gave you hope that something else was possible? Yeah, that's a, you know, such a good point. So we were actually working again with the, with the old model. Look, you're looking at could we understand the fundamental nature of the neurodegenerative process? And we worked on this for 30 years in the laboratory looking at following cells that committed suicide, cell death, just as it happens in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's and other degenerative And this conditions. was at UCLA? This was at multiple places. This was at UCLA. This was at the Burnham Institute in San Diego. And then this was at the Buck Institute uh, in Northern California. And so we looked specifically at the drivers of this. And what we found was very interesting. So there are many different things that impact on an example, APP. So this is the thing that is at the heart of Alzheimer's disease. APP is a protein called amyloid precursor protein. So it's actually the parent molecule of the amyloid that we associate with Alzheimer's disease. And what we found was that this thing actually is a molecular switch. So it actually responds to these many different processes. And what happens, it's, it's a, kind of amazing because it's a, it's a little bit like having you know, the president of your country. And in the book I wrote about it as, you know, you're the president of my brain of Stan. So when you've got things that are actually going well, you have enough trophic support. You, know, you don't have invaders, uh, whether it's invaders to your country or invaders to your brain. Uh, you don't have major problems with inflation, et cetera. And I like an inflation to, uh, uh, to insulin sensitivity versus resistance. Then no surprise, you decide to grow and maintain. And that's what your brain is doing when things are good. And therefore, your APP is actually cut. And this thing is sitting in the membranes of your neurons. It is to a lesser extent in other cells as well. And it is particularly rich at synapses. So this thing is sitting there and it's gauging these various inputs. So it responds, interestingly, to things like your estradiol level, your testosterone level, your vitamin D level, your status of inflammation, and on and on. When things are good, this molecule will be cut at a single site, which is just outside the membrane, and one peptide that results now signals others to say things are good. I'm going to support making and keeping synapses. In other words, we can afford to make and keep new synapses. We can afford neuroplasticity. The other piece of it is inside is signaling to that cell to say, yes, 
we're going to support growth and maintenance. So again, very much like the head of a country saying, this is what we're going to do as a country. On the other hand, when you now change that formula, you reduce your estradiol or your testosterone, your vitamin D, you have inflammation, you have now invasion, no surprise, you have a completely different response. Now you actually have that same molecule that is cleaved at three sites, beta, gamma, and caspase sites. It therefore produces four peptides, two that are external, two that are internal. And now the message is completely different. The message is we are being invaded or we don't have enough support to make new synapses. Therefore, the only way we're going to survive is to pull back. So it's literally saying, you, you have got to have a brain in retreat. We know that, okay, we're gonna send out this amyloid, which is now going to kill the invading microbes. It actually binds some of the invading toxins, like for example, iron, high iron levels. Uh, the A-beta actually binds to this, as Professor Ashley, Ashley Bush showed many years ago. So these things are responding to insults and therefore actually protective. But in protecting, they are say, saying, we're going to live with a smaller brain. We're going to live with fewer synapses. Now, Drew, you can imagine what's going to happen. You just keep the insult going. Keep people exposed to the same thing. The doctor doesn't check the right things. You get continued exposure. What do you think happens? You just keep going down, down. You keep on pulling back, pulling up. Now, if you can identify what's doing that, you can get rid of that, and you can now stop the process and begin the rebuilding. And so you really do have to look at what's driving this because you can see fundamentally how this works with APP being cleaved to go one direction or to go another direction. And that's what the research showed us. So the goal then was to take all of that research over those years and now translate that into a workable program. If you do it in a generic sense and just say, well, everybody do this, this, and this, Yes, it works sometimes, but many times you don't identify what's actually driving the problem. So you really do have to be a Sherlock Holmes. You really have to do, get in there, um, just as, of course, as, as uh, uh, Dr. Hyman and his colleagues do with looking at integrative medicine. You want to look at the things that are driving the process. This is a root cause analysis. The good news is the research shows us many of these root causes. We know the things that are driving this decline, and therefore for each person we can tease these out and then have a program. So this is a personalized program that is going to be targeted, this is precision medicine, targeted toward the things that are actually driving the decline. Or of course, the hope is targeting to the things that are giving you risk, that there isn't decline there already. So that's what the research showed us over the years. By the way, it also showed us that when you start to, to ferret this out, you find that there are different subtypes of Alzheimer's, and that was very helpful in terms of addressing the underlying drivers. So before we talk about the subtypes, which we'll get to in a second, when you did that initial culmination of that research that you continued at multiple places, yeah. ultimately that led to designing a protocol, a program right. that right. you would trial and error and put people on. And then that led to the publishing of the first case studies that are there. Talk right. to us about that. What were some of the first case studies that you published and, and what was the goal of them? What did you show and what was the goal for the larger community to see what was possible in, the, in, the, in these case studies? Yes, good point. So we actually started by looking then once we kind of could see this balance, this molecular switch, we thought this was now back in 2007, we thought, okay, great, let's develop a drug that changes that balance. And we kind of weren't looking at root cause at the time. We thought, okay, if APP can go either direction, let's simply develop a drug that forces it in the, the good direction. Well, of course, it turns out that's an overly simplistic way to think about it. Back in 2007, we didn't realize that. So we screened thousands of drug candidates to look for things that would actually put you on the right side of that balance. And so we identified a few, actually, we identified some that had very good brain penetration that looked like very good candidates for drugs. But as we got set to do the first clinical trial, and this was now back in 2011, I realized, well, wait a minute, we're going to end up, these other things that cause this 
this cleavage are simply going to go around our drug. I mean, that's kind of this idea of just hitting it at one point when you've got a very complex network of things going on. Um, it, it became clear to me that that was an overly simplistic way to attack this network. It's a little bit like saying, okay, you know, we're going to see, we're going to try to change the entire culture of your company. We're going to change, you know, one person who's, a, you know, who's doing reception in, in Cleveland or something like that. It's not that simple. You're going to have to change key locations throughout. You're changing the culture of your entire company. Same idea here. We are changing network function for a very complex network of synapses within the brain. And therefore, I thought, okay, in this trial, we'll do the drug we discovered, but let's also target all the different things that are contributing to it. Let's look at whether NF-kappa B is activated as part of inflammation. Let's look at whether there is insulin resistance, whether the hormones are too low, whether there are specific toxins, et cetera. So in 2011, then, we proposed the first comprehensive trial in the history of Alzheimer's disease. And we were quickly turned down by the review boards because they said, hey, you're trying to look at more than one variable. And so we said, yeah, but this is a more than one variable disease. It's overly simplistic to say, okay, we're just gonna hit it with one thing that does one, hits one little piece and we're gonna expect everything to fall in line. That's not the way the brain works. It's not and the way so that life works in many aspects. You know, Absolutely. Like what's the way, one thing that makes a relationship successful. And if people just did that one thing, then every relationship would be successful. Well, unfortunately, it's not just one thing. You know, it's so true. And then, and then here, you know, we're hearing the same thing now with aging. Let's just take a drug and aging will go away. And, you know, that's again, that's not the way aging works. There are many contributors. And so, you know, we're looking at the same sort of thing for anti-aging, as you mentioned earlier. And right now, we're actually looking at patient zeros with other diseases. So we had our patient zero back in 2012. What happened was when we got turned down in 2011, we started looking at how do we convince the review boards that we should, in fact, be doing a multivariable trial because that's the way the disease works. And so at that time, I got a call from a woman actually whose friend was about to commit suicide who lived back on the East Coast. She'd already been told by her doctor, you have Alzheimer's disease. Her mother had died from Alzheimer's as well. Uh, she was told that, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. You're going to die from this disease, etc. And then he wrote in the chart, you know, Alzheimer's disease. And then she was unable to get long-term insurance, which is common when you, if someone writes memory problems in your chart or neurodegeneration or Alzheimer's disease, you're not gonna be able to purchase long-term care insurance. So she had decided to commit suicide. She called her friend who happened to be on the, on the West Coast, um, who said, well, I, I've heard that there's some research going on at the Buck Institute, maybe you should come out here. So I got a call and I said, look, you know, I haven't seen a patient in 20 years. We've been working in a lab on this. I said, you know, if you're a mouse, I can probably help you. Um, but, uh, you know, as a human being, probably, you know, probably not. But I can tell you what our research has shown and what we, I can tell you what we were going to do for the clinical trial. So we, we spent hours going over all these little pieces. And she, of course, uh, her memory was not good. She was writing all this stuff down. And I said, look, if you want to you know, take this back to your doctor on the East Coast, uh, talk to him about it. But that's all I really have to offer right now because we're not allowed to do the trial. So I was really shocked when three months later, I got a call in my home on a Saturday. And she said, I can't believe it. And she said, I'm back at work. My memory's better than it's been in 20 years. Things are great. And, and now she is over eight years from when she started this. And as you know, the natural history for cognitive decline is for nothing but decline. You may have a good day and a bad day here and there, but, but the natural history is for continued decline. So anyone who's having the problem she did eight years ago would be expected to be in a nursing home by now. She is now in her mid-70s. She's doing great. In fact, she's working as a brain health coach. Um, she still travels overseas uh, and uh, is doing all sorts of things, um, doing very, very well. And, and interestingly, she actually went off the program four different times, as I mentioned in the book. Uh, and each time, after about seven to 10 days, she began to experience some decline once again. Uh, you know, the bottom line is you need to keep that signaling going in the right direction. And as long as you do that, the great news is you've actually gotten at 
the contributors, the things that are driving the process. And so you can continue to do well. And we see people all the time who will improve and then stabilize and then add different pe- uh, features, attack something else, improve further, and continue to do that. So that's another When you stop the doing the work, it stops working. Absolutely. And then that's what exactly what she's experienced. And so she's really stuck with it and done um, extremely well. Um, another big surprise has been that we talked to people about 36 holes in the roof because we initially identified 36 different molecular mechanisms that all contribute to this process. And so we want to attack them all. Well, the good news is you don't have to attack every single one of them, just as uh, others have shown in the past with cardiovascular disease. Uh, such as Dr. Dean Ornish, for example, Um, you can see this once you get over the threshold, people begin to get on the correct side. They're actually improving things instead of getting worse. And we see the same thing with cognition. Once you get over that threshold, you don't have to address every single thing. In her case, by the way, she, she addressed 12 out of the 36, and for her, that was enough. That put her on the right side, she's improved, and now over eight years later, she's continuing to do very, very well. And we have a number of other people who started early on, 2012, 2013, 2014, who years down the road are still doing extremely well. You know, the, the power of that story for anybody who's listening here is not just the hope that through addressing some of these root factors, you can get better, but also, you know, while it's encouraged that people find, let's say, a practitioner that can support them because some of these things like addressing mycotoxins or heavy metals or some of the deeper root issues require maybe a doctor or a functional medicine doctor to support you on them, at least at the more advanced stage. But for the vast majority of the things that she did, because you couldn't see her as a patient, she did them on her own in conjunction with her own doctor. And that's really telling of where medicine, because it's highly personalized, and also so many of these interventions to address these insults are lifestyle driven components, we can actually, in a way, start to become, it's always good to have a doctor, but we can start to become our own doctor in a way. And I really see that as the promise of your book. It's like, how can you start with these things here? And also laying out where you absolutely do need a doctor to be involved, but many of these things you can start just in your own home. Absolutely. I think that's, that's a great point. And, you know, Part of this, the second book addresses the things that came from the first book. So one of the things people said was, we want more details. Okay, we get it. You're telling us about all the science that happened in the lab and how you could translate this into humans, but we want details. What websites to go, what doctors to see, all that. So how that's much should I eat exactly on the keto flex diet? You know, what's exactly the way to think about exercise or sleep? Yeah, and what workarounds? If we can't do this part, what can we do instead? So one of the things we did that I was really excited about is we took, we have a unique combination of three people. So I actually wrote this in the handbook part that gives all the details. We did this with a patient who is actually doing this extremely successfully herself. This is Julie G who started the APOE4.info and with my wife, uh, Dr. Aida Lachine Bredesen, who is a clinician. And so we have a user who's doing very, very well and has gotten all the workarounds and doing the things and knows what, what has worked for her and what has worked less well for her. And she is APOE 4-4, as she describes in the book, uh, and had significant decline. And she's doing very, very well and scoring 98th, 99th percentile on cognitive tests repeatedly. And then my wife, who is really who introduced me to integrative medicine years ago and is very interested in this area. And then my start part for the, the neurology and the, and, the, and the molecular science. So these together, we kind of have a triad here that can give you the best of all three worlds. So I was really excited to do that. And then, as you mentioned, to show people that, look, you don't have to wait for decline. You can actually improve your current cognition and you can prevent the future decline. So we've developed something we call pre-code, which is actually now coming out just in the next couple of months. So you can now look at what are the things you can do 
to analyze the things that are putting you at greatest risk. You don't necessarily have to go through as long as many tests as you do for what we call recode, for reversal of cognitive decline, to do prevention of cognitive decline. You can look at a slightly smaller set, and then you can do some basics on your own. Now, if you ever have problems, you can then go to your physician. We've now trained over 1,500 physicians in 10 different countries and all over the U.S. We've got new training that's actually coming out uh, in late July, early August uh, of this year. So we're starting to set, set it up so that there's a network so that we can actually impact the global burden of dementia. Mm, it's powerful. Give us an example of those things that are maybe happening in our 30s and 40s that are part of our lifestyle that we don't necessarily think as being major contributing factors to the building blocks that could eventually lead to cognitive decline or full-blown Alzheimer's. Like they're so baked into how society operates and thinks and functions that we just kind of think of it as normal, but it could be setting us up for something much more traumatic to happen down the way. Absolutely. And I think there's the, you know, the common ones, as, as you kind of uh, alluded to, and then the ones that completely take us by surprise. So we're all used to hearing, you know, what's happening with insulin resistance. So many of us are walking around. I just heard a, the, the all-time record the other day, someone who came walking in with an insulin, fasting insulin of 72. You know, usually we like to see this, as Mark points out, four, four and a half, you know, kind of in that range. We worry when it's getting up to 8, 10, 15. I've seen them as high as 32 uh, or 36 even. But as for someone to come in with 72, that's just amazing. So this person is just working overtime, overtime, overtime to try to produce enough insulin. It's literally going to run out of gas at some point. Is walking around not realizing that they are setting themselves up at, for huge risk for cognitive decline. Metabolic syndrome which affects somewhere around 60 million Americans with that combination, insulin resistance, uh, dyslipidemia, uh, some uh, degree of uh, obesity, all these things, hypertension, these things. This is a huge problem. And so this is one that we're kind of living with and not realizing. We are getting this in our 20s, 30s, 40s, not checking it, not recognizing until. But the thing that really takes us by surprise I have to admit, is the toxin exposure. When we started this work, we had no idea that this was a critical and incredibly common contributor to Alzheimer's. So what happened was, we started back in 2012, we were really looking at what became type 1, type 1.5, and type 2, improving the support, improving the trophic factors, improving hormones, reducing inflammation, improving insulin sensitivity. We had a set of people that just didn't respond, and we wanted to understand what was going on. And I actually started by calling some of the spouses and saying, you know, let's find out where did this person grow up? You know, what's going on with their lives? What are the genetics? You know, what's contributed to this problem? And they also looked different. That's been the surprise. People who have toxins as part of their Alzheimer's often will present instead of amnestically with your typical, I can't learn new information, they'll often have, I'm having trouble with organizing things. I'm having trouble learning my new iPhone. I'm having trouble at my job. I'm having trouble with calculations. I'm having trouble with visual recognition. I'm having trouble with spatial orientation. All of these non-amnestic presentations. They often will have depression as one of the problems at the beginning. And these people turned out to have exposure to three different types of toxins. So you've got to look at the inorganics, things like metals. And you know the story of air pollution. That's turned out to be more and more common as a cause. So be careful out there on the freeways. Don't get too much of that air pollution you know, into your lungs and ultimately to your brains. Then second one, organics. Things like formaldehyde and toluene and glyphosate all these various organic toxins that we are exposed to, these are critical. And as an example, someone who had many, many years of exposure 
to uh, paraffin candle burning um, developed cognitive decline. So be careful about these organics. And we've seen these where these sneak up on people. They don't know about their exposure. They don't realize their glutathione has become low trying to fight this stuff. They don't realize that they've got this stuff in depots in their body. And one of the things that, that happens is as you approach menopause or andropause, as you know, you're now changing the way you're dealing with your bone. You have a little more on the, uh, on the osteoclastic side. You're releasing this stuff back into the bloodstreams. And so many, many of these people are presenting late 40s to late 50s in that decade with beginning cognitive changes at that time. And they have various organics or the third group, biotoxins. I've been shocked to see how common it is for people to come in with cognitive decline that turns out to have as a major contributor toxins that are produced by mold species. And as you know, it's typically the big five. It's not all mold species. It's the stachybotrys, the penicillium, the aspergillus, ketomium, and wallemia. Those are the big five. So if you've got those running around your basement, around your house, if you've got black mold in your house or you haven't taken care of that mold problem, please check to see, first of all, check your ERMI score. Um, that is your EPA relative mold index, or you can use another score called Hurts Me Too. They're both fine. And they will look at whether in fact you've got mold, those mold species especially within your home or place of work. And then look to see whether in fact you've got evidence of these mycotoxins. You can do this looking at responses made in your blood, looking at whether you've got these in your sinuses, because they sometimes will actually grow, the, the molds themselves will grow in the sinuses. We have Take people with nasal chronic sinuses. Microbiome. Absolutely. And that's, as you know, that's another huge player. And looking at oral microbiome, another big one that wasn't clear years ago, becoming more and more clear, sinus microbiome, and then of course, gut microbiome all huge. And of course, the brain microbiome has turned out to be a surprise that we were always taught that the brain should be a sterile organ, right? <laughs> but it's not, it's, it's still controversial. We don't know if that's the norm. But what we do know is if you look at the brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease, what do you see in there? You mm. see oral, you see oral bacteria such as P. gingivalis and T. denticola. You see mold species, you see fun, fungal species such as some of the candida species. You see things like Borrelia, spirochetes, things like that. Uh, and you see viruses, herpes simplex, HHV6A being two of the, the most common ones. These are all critical things, and you're responding to this invasion by making the amyloid that we associate with Alzheimer's disease. So again, it comes back to supporting your immune system and things like that. So the big surprise, these three different groups of toxins, you're living in them, you don't know it, no one bothers to check, and then you come down with cognitive decline, and then typically people still don't check. But if you, if you bother to look, you will see that these are contributing factors. So all of us can do better by checking these things when we're younger and minimizing them. Getting on basic detox is so huge, as you know. It's so true. And I think a, a huge part of it, as you're really talking about, is, is awareness. And yeah, the more awareness that you have, the more likely it is that you can actually uh, start to look in this direction because we know from the World Health Organization and a lot of building surveys that are there, it's, it's estimated that two-thirds of buildings in North America could have mold inside of them at some degree that's harmful for human health. But if we look at even the real estate game as a whole, mm -hmm. you know, all the mold inspectors are not really trained and not incentivized to be looking for mold. In fact, they want to, you know, give give simple enough checks and a lot of the mold that's there is not viewable to the eye, to the naked eye. It's not black mold immediately that you can see. Sometimes it's the case. It's behind the dishwasher and there's a mold colony that's there that's been there since the last homeowner had it. Or if you're renting an apartment, you know, I'm here in Santa Monica, a friend of mine just came back and said, how do I even see the level of mold that's in my house? Because I'm having memory issues. I'm having other stuff. I'm having sinus things. 
I eat healthy. I wear like a glucose monitor. I'm doing all these things that are there, but yeah. I still feel like something is going on. And you mentioned the ERMI test. That's yeah. a that's an air test that people can get done and then can look up ERMI in their in their area. But it's almost like what I love about what you just shared is that you're giving people permission and encouragement to go and look for these items. Increasingly since the industrial revolution, we are living in a more toxic world. And these toxins are taking and wreaking major havoc on our health. Even as you mentioned with COVID-19, one of the primary uh, correlators with COVID-19 in many of these uh, cities has been air pollution that they've found. People yeah. that are exposed to heavy amounts of air pollution uh, that comes from, you know, not just cars, but indoor off-gassing. These are all factors that play a role. And the, the key is, as overwhelming as it can be, because sometimes it feels like a lot, there's this mold issue, there's this heavy metal and that, it's that we can get started somewhere and we can start with the basics and work our way up. Not so that we address all these insults at once, but we can find the ones that are key to us. So actually, that's a great question to ask you. You know, part of the book, um, The End of Alzheimer's Program, is helping people get clear on maybe where they can get started first for them. So how do people think about that? When you're talking to people who are about to embark the program, how are they beginning to lay out the chips and at least even start where, at least decide where to get started? Yeah, that's a, you know that's a great point. And you know you can think of this like you know you're sitting in your home for example, and you know there's a fire out there and it's it's advancing toward you. Well, if you can put it out when it's out there and kind of put, push it back, then in fact it's less likely to come to your house. Once it gets to your house, you know you've got a lot of things to do, but you can get rid of it while it's out there. At least beat it back and really buy yourself you know decades potentially. And we should have people who are you know good cognition until they're a hundred. So you can get started in a number of ways. There's the basics, and then there are the things that are targeted. On the basics, there is diet, exercise, sleep, stress, brain training, basic detox, and some basic supplements. So those, what we think of as kind of the seven core features, and we talk about these uh, in the book as well. So just getting yourself into a plant-rich, mild, ketotic diet with some fasting. You know, fasting has turned out to be so remarkably helpful for everything from hypertension to cognition to preventing, uh, helping in the prevention of Alzheimer's disease uh, to, you know, improving vascular status, improving insulin sensitivity, you know, on and on and on. So just doing basics like that, and we go into great detail in the book for specific things to buy, specific things for the so-called KetoFlex 12-3 diet, then uh, exercise, just basic things with both strength training and aerobic training, sleep, as I mentioned, that may be the, the most overlooked. People don't bother to check to see if they have nocturnal hypoxia, and it's incredibly common. Um, and, and then the best course, way to check that is through a sleep center? You can do it. Yeah, actually, it's pretty easy now. You can actually do uh, just get yourself an oximeter. And there are a number of good oximeters out there that can actually record for you um, your oxygenation. So again, this is something more and more health we're seeing as quantified self. You know, now you can have your Apple Watch and you can you can look at things. You can look at your heart rate. You can look at your oxygen saturation. And by the way, you can look at your oxygen saturation, you know, at a moment's notice with your iPhone. Uh, that's that's simple to do. But if you want to record it all night, um, you want to have an oximeter. And yes, you can get this from your doctor. You can, as you said, you can do a sleep study, but you can also do it more simply by just recording it with an oximeter and then see if you're dropping below that, that target of 96 to 98%. Uh, percent. And then again, stress. Um, incredible. As you know, there are now spikes. And when I got an interesting email from a neurologist yesterday who's seeing a spike in her practice, uh, looking at people with cognitive decline. They, everyone's anxious, everyone's stressed out, everyone's indoors, everybody's depressed and worried. There's so much going on in the world right now. And of course, this contributes to everything from hypertension to cognitive decline. So getting that, and just I, again, as a scientist, 
I never thought I would be talking about things like meditation. I thought this is, you know, not helpful. And yet I can't deny the statistics are there. The publications are there. Neuroplasticity is undoubtedly enhanced with forms of meditation like TM, like mindfulness, like things like that. So this is really important. And then brain training. Again, each one of these things isolated doesn't have a huge impact. But as part of an overall program, these are getting you over that hump. These are making it so that you are now on the right side of plasticity, so that you are able to lay down and keep new synapses. And then some basic detox. And I'm, you know, I'm learning this myself with de detoxing myself with during the COVID-19. One of the things I started doing was using chronometer a lot more. So I'm looking every day at what I'm doing right, what I'm doing wrong, how much fiber I have, how much protein I have, all these sorts of things. And critical to that is getting appropriate fiber, which turns out to be so helpful for detox, among other things, for improving your glycemic uh, load from various uh, foods and things like that, improving your insulin sensitivity, uh, and to improving your lipid numbers. So these things are all helpful. And then basic things like uh, filtered water, uh, sweating frequently, following up with uh, non-emollient soaps and things like that, or non-toxic soaps. Uh, all of these things critical for keeping your toxin level low. HEPA filters, um, I encourage people, especially if there's any question about molds, of course you wanna have remediation, but also you wanna have a HEPA filter. Um, improve the air where you are living, you know, you, it will be helpful. And you mentioned earlier, people get overwhelmed. Just to know, if you have water intrusion in your home, if you have a history of water damage, you're likely to have some mold issues. If you've truly had, from the very beginning, there's never been any water intrusion, uh, which is relatively uncommon, most of us have had some of that, then you're probably in pretty good shape. But if you've ever had any water damage, and we have people, by the way, who will start to get better and then have a leak in their home, and literally they can tell their cognition mm -hmm. will signal the leak in the home faster than the spouse will find it so that they will actually go downhill within 24 hours and then they'll start looking oh yeah here's new new water intrusion that we were unaware of so this is a this is a surprising and important correlation so these are some of the basic things that you can use to get started and there are some basic supplements i know mark talks about these a lot but even you know things that that uh, look at things like your uh, insulin sensitivity some you know basic detox, making sure that you have enough. And I would say one of the common ones that people leave out is choline. Uh, males should have about 550 milligrams per day of choline or more. Females, 450 milligrams or more. And we talk about this in the book. And I find uh, that just about every day, I am a little on the low side with choline. We don't tend to get as much choline as we should. And, and most, most people, people the are choline fun. that they're getting is through like eggs? Occasionally some eggs, some liver, things like that. Um, and so, yeah, we, we need to do a better job of that. And that's, you, 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 know, you can certainly support that, um, not only with things like pastured eggs and stuff, but also with things like citicoline uh, or with GPC choline. Um, some easy ways to get yourself to make sure that you're getting uh, that, that 550 milligrams, or if you're a female, uh, 450 milligrams. Uh, most of us are low. And, and of course, this is the precursor for acetylcholine, which is the most important neurotransmitter for storing memory and making memory. So <clears throat> you need appropriate acetylcholine. You also need appropriate glutamate for getting the appropriate memories. And there are other pieces to this as well, uh, you know, such as uh, uh, nor, uh, noradrenal, norepinephrine, um, which are which are key for for level of uh, 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 of attention uh, and uh, and level of consciousness, um, and then things like dopamine, which of course are important for that reward uh, feeling. So all of these work together, but acetylcholine is is the most important one, and of course this is why people take uh, Aricept, which inhibits breakdown of acetylcholine to give themselves that little boost when they have Alzheimer's disease. But of course, it doesn't work by itself terribly well. So I encourage everybody, please make sure that you are not choline deficient. Make sure that you are not vitamin D deficient. 
you know, make sure that you are not deficient in, in important hormones and trophic factors that are critical for laying down and keeping memory storage. And then beyond that, you want to do targeting. As we said earlier, you know, looking at the key things that are driving this. If you've got toxins around that you're unaware of, which so many of us do, let's find out, you know, before the fire gets to your house, let's find out because this thing is brewing. And by the way, the same thing is being reported in Parkinson's disease. People who didn't realize that they had long-term exposure to things like trichloroethylene and glyphosate and Agent Orange and, uh, you know, and on and on and on, things that are inhibitors of complex one especially. These are things that increase your risk for Parkinson's disease. So these things are brewing for years. And if we're aware of them before they actually make major impacts, you only get the symptoms late in the disease. And again, that's another part of 21st century medicine that's not emphasized enough. What we see as disease is the end stage of a chronic process that's been going on for decades. The good news is, and as Mark has championed for years, we can now check these things. We, we can check these diseases before they strike us symptomatically. So we should all be aware of the pre-symptomatic stages. Are you in a pre-symptomatic stage of Parkinson's? Are you in a pre-symptomatic stage of what will ultimately be Alzheimer's? Are you in a pre-symptomatic stage of heart disease? And on and on. That's the good news on the chronic illnesses. We can see them coming. The bad news is that people have not been doing that. So that when they finally get a diagnosis, this is a fairly late stage, and we really have to work hard now, not only to get rid of the drivers, but then to rebuild. And I, but I do think there are some great things coming with stem cells for helping us to rebuild these lost synapses. And I think that will be a part of the overall. We've had people already go on the program and then add stem cells and get an additional bump. So I think we're gonna see more and more of that. Using stem cells alone is a little bit like trying to rebuild the house as it's burning down. Let's put out the fire first, then we try to rebuild the house as opposed to trying to do that you know, as it's still on fire. Stem cells and some of these advanced therapies that are available to us now that really technology is making available, they're like icing on the cake, right? Absolutely. But we still need a foundational, yeah base that we want to build on, which is all these dietary lifestyle recommendations that many individuals can, um, can get a chance to, to follow. So Absolutely. For, some, for somebody who's listening now may have some history of cognitive decline in their family, some family members that have had Alzheimer's because it's so prevalent um, and they're in their, let's say, 50s or, or 60s and they're not seeing that they you know, they're not maybe noticing or what they see as like, they're not sure if they're having cognitive decline or not. And they want to get the first step, which is sort of just assessing where they are, right? How bad are things? Have they just gotten used to their memory falling a little bit here and there, or is actually something more serious going on? What would you recommend for them as the first step of options? Is it doing that, um, uh, basically, uh, I forgot the term, but the similar cognitive uh, test that you said that's similar to like a colonoscopy? Cognoscopy, exactly. Cognoscopy. Right. And you can actually, yeah, you can, you can now you know, get this you know, directly. So yeah, very good point. And I think you know, if we're going to impact the global burden of dementia, if we're going to take these 45 million Americans who are going to get Alzheimer's and reduce that as close to zero as we can, we need to have everybody think about this and get on prevention. And I would break these into two groups. And I think it's important to mention a group that's, that's rarely mentioned. So 95% of people who develop Alzheimer's have sporadic Alzheimer's. So in other words, it's not in the genes that you're going to have. Yes, they may have increased risk with ApoE4, which is the common one. And there are dozens of genes that increase your risk, but ApoE4 is the common and, and striking one. If you have a single copy of ApoE4, uh, it increases your risk from about 9% through your lifetime to 30%. If you have two copies, it's well over 50%. So that's an important one for sure. And there are about, about 
75 million Americans who have a single copy. And again, none of these people should be getting Alzheimer's disease. And there are about 7 million who have two copies. And again, starting early, none of them. But I want to mention the small segment. F about 5%, just under 5% of the people who develop Alzheimer's have familial Alzheimer's. And there has been nothing for these people in the past. And drug approaches have failed with this group. And so they just know if they have the gene. And this is typically three genes, mutations in APP, presenilin-1, or presenilin-2. So for those people, and they often will get symptoms in their 30s, 40s, or 50s, very significant symptoms. It comes on early. They know it'll, it'll hit the parents. You know, Half of the siblings will get it. It's a dominantly inherited gene. I would encourage them, please get on all the appropriate things for prevention. Get evaluated, get on that in your 20s. Because again, you may be getting symptoms in your 30s or 40s. So start as early as you can and really optimize everything. There is a real opportunity here, I think, for the first time to have impacts. We'll see. There are some people who are already doing this. We'll see how it goes. Now, for people who are not in that group, which is the vast majority, um, then for them, I, I would encourage them to start when they're in their early 40s. So we usually say, you know, 45, that's fine. If you've got a family history that starts young, then a little earlier than that. And you want to know your status on the basics. Do you have ongoing inflammation? Do you have ongoing insulin resistance or glycotoxicity? Do you have specific trophic factors, hormones, or nutrients that are low? Do you have specific toxins? Do you have vascular component? We see a number of people where that's the major problem. And as you know, they get hypertension. They may even have uh, a little suggestion of a stroke or a, or a TIA. They get thrown on statins. They have these low cholesterols. And they're then over time, they're not perfusing their brains the way they should. These are the people who actually will do well with things like EWOT, exercise with oxygen therapy. Help perfuse, help you to do the right things and get that, you know, you want to get the oxygen, but you want to get the blood flow as well. And then do you have histories of trauma? All of these things are critical. Find out where you stand and then get on an optimal protocol to address those things, starting with the basics. And people will say, oh, this is just about lifestyle. Well, no, it's about the things that are actually driving the decline. And of course, you want to include lifestyle. Why would you throw that out? That is an important contributor. The old idea from when I was in, back in medical school years ago was that, oh, you know, it's not that important. You know, eat some food, get, you know, get some protein, but it's not a big deal. Uh, it was mostly focused on, on weight loss, if anything. Yeah. It was just keep your weight you know, not too, too high. It's, yeah, it's all about prescribing the right drug. Well, it turns out, of course, that getting at these upstream contributors is actually more important. The drugs are going to be important. I believe that drugs for Alzheimer's will be helpful, but they should be used on the backbone of this foundation of the things that are driving the process. Then you can target your drug. And, you know, there have been over 400 different trials for Alzheimer's that have failed. Virtually, and in some case, made people's situation worse off. Exactly. So it's not just that the drugs aren't helping. In some cases, they're actually hurting, at least so far. Maybe ultimately, they'll add and we'll be figure out a way to integrate them more with protocols like yours that are there. But at least so far, it's either nothing or making the situation worse. That's so true. And I should mention, just in the last couple of days, yet another drug has failed, and that was intranasal insulin. So the idea was, let's give you intranasal insulin, get it into your brain. The good news about intranasal uh, a, a delivery of things like nerve growth factor and things like that is that you can get them into the brain. Glutathione, another one, you can deliver it, deliver intranasally into the brain. So the idea was, okay, your insulin signaling is not perfect. Let's just add insulin. Now, again, you know, we recognize it's the insulin resistance. You don't overcome insulin resistance by just giving more insulin. That is an overly simplistic way. We want to improve the insulin signaling, not just give a big, you know, a, a, a big pocket of, of insulin. Uh, and so this failed, unfortunately, it did not show any improvement whatsoever um, in cognition. So yet another 
you know, monotherapy that has failed. And the, the drugs have been used the wrong way. I think when, when they're used appropriately with the backbone of getting at the drivers and then targeting the things that are still there, for example, targeting uh, specific toxins that may be there, um, enhancing some of the cholinergic transmission, fine. But doing that alone is not addressing the various pieces that are making this network dysfunction. So I think, again, that there will be a place for these, but it will be on the backbone of, dri of looking at the drivers. Mm. So profound. And I want to ask you, you know, in your process of putting this material out and your book was so groundbreaking, breaking the first book. And I imagine that this will only build upon it because it makes the protocol a lot more accessible, clearer for people and a lot more case studies, testimonials, tips and tricks that you've gotten from your community. But uh, when that first book came out and since then, because you're coming in with such a completely different worldview when it comes to this uh, disease and cognitive decline, what kind of backlash have you faced from whether it's the medical community or organizations, uh, how has it been received and have you faced backlash, I should say? Tremendous backlash. In fact, we've had people literally writing things in journals about you know, how terrible I am to say these things and you know, what's, what's wrong with me and how dare I say. And these are people who have absolutely nothing to offer their patients. So the, the idea that we're saying, okay, here's something that seems to work for people, but I have nothing, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna now denigrate uh, what's actually working uh, is so ridiculous. But of course, there's a history in this, okay? As they say, anytime you change the, an approach you make a kind of a paradigm shift, you're going to go through these three periods. The first period is denial. And when the paper first came out in 2014 with just the first 10 cases, people tried to ignore it. Uh, and then- There was a the fluke, you didn't study it correctly, it, it, your yeah, numbers are off, there's maybe fraud involved, whatever yeah. it might be. Exactly. And one of the things they said was, yeah, this is only 10 cases and, and we don't believe they had Alzheimer's. So in fact, I, in fact, I got, a, got a call from the Alzheimer's Association saying, you know, we don't believe that they had Alzheimer's. I said, okay, great. Pull out the paper. Let's go through each one. And I can show you very specifically why each of these people did. So then we published 100 patients where we have documented improvement in all 100. This comes from 15 different clinics. All people that have taken the course that we had and that have used this approach all getting excellent results. And then the response was, oh, well, um, you know, it wasn't a double blind placebo controlled trial. Well, again, people unfortunately, they, they learn some tag you know, lines, they, they, they have these buzzwords. They, they, they don't stop to think, is something better than nothing? Yes. When you've got something that is working for people, of course, we'll get there. We're, by the way, we are in the middle now of the first trial that is a comprehensive trial. It's the first trial in history where instead of predetermining a treatment, which is what all previous trials have done, we're gonna use this drug or this lifestyle change or what have you, we take each person and we look to see what's driving the process, just as we've been talking about, and then we target all of those things. And that'll be finished in December, it's very um, exciting. With, oh, it's, it's, yeah, this is going to be very exciting. They wouldn't, we, again, we, we got turned down repeatedly. We got turned down again in 2018. Finally, in 2019, we got approval to go ahead with this trial because it is multivariable. It is a protocol, a precision medicine protocol. Which, which also means you can't do a placebo control because people know whether or not they're doing these interventions or not. That's exactly right. So the good news is there have been so many people with both Alzheimer's and pre-Alzheimer's, MCI or mild cognitive impairment treated, that we have a natural history. So you can literally just compare this to the natural history. And that's being done now repeatedly in other publications that are looking at various changes, but they're not targeting the things that are actually causing the decline. So I'm very enthusiastic about this trial. I'm working with Dr. Ann Hathaway, uh, Dr. Uh, Kathleen Toops, uh, and Dr. Deborah Gordon, just fantastic physicians who are treating the patients and looking with this sort of protocol, looking at, okay, can we, can we get at the things that each patient has? And we're, you know, no surprise, uh, finding the very things that we've talked about before that drive this process and being able now to target those things. So that should be published next year. And I'm very enthusiastic because I think that is 
the way of the future, the way that we will be treating neurodegenerative diseases in the future, which this has been the area of greatest biomedical therapeutic failure, is not to give them some predetermined drug, but to look to see what's actually driving the process, just as we do with heart disease, just as we do with type 2 diabetes, et cetera, and now addressing those things. It seems obvious, but unfortunately, it's not been standard of care. And so I look forward to the day when that is the standard of care for, you know, going forward. And, you know, earlier you were sharing that, you know, what you recommend for different people in different categories at different ages. And the truth is, is that a lot of the factors that go into the end of Alzheimer's protocol that you've come up with with your team, when we address those and we integrate them into our life, even if we are not headed towards the pathway of cognitive decline or somebody's not worried about that, but they might be dealing with impotence or they might be, be dealing with, you know, vascular, you know, or worried about heart disease or worried about their skin health. Like all these things are addressed through the same protocol, right? It's a foundational thing that just is going to improve your overall health. So even if you're somebody like me who I'm 37, I already practice many of these things. I'm lucky yeah. enough to work with a functional medicine doctor yeah. and I have looked at my metals and cleaned up my dental health and looked at mycotoxins in my house. I'm doing it not just because I'm worried about, you know, Alzheimer's, which I'm not necessarily worried about just that. Right. I'm worried. I'm just focused on improving my overall health. And that's the beauty of this protocol and how clearly it's been broken down as it can be related to autoimmune conditions and other areas. Many, much in the same way that we, you know, we had Terry Walls in the pro on the program. Right. She talked about how many people do her program, even if they don't struggle with MS, because it's improving many other aspects that they're, you know, dealing with in their life. You know, this is really important going forward. And one of the things, the biochemistry is different for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Lewy body, frontotemporal dementia, ALS, on and on and on. But so we have to adjust this. And we're now beginning something called the ARC project, where we adjust this for the appropriate genetics and biochemistry. But as you indicated, there's a core of things that are critical, as Terry Walls has shown with MS. And our own daughter, by the way, developed lupus years ago. And this is one of the things that got us started in this area. We thought, my wife and I thought, what is going on? Why did she get lupus? We actually took our daughter to two world experts in lupus who both said, yeah, she's got early lupus. There's nothing to do. When she gets worse, we can put her on some steroids, you know, that sort of thing. And we thought something's missing here. So we actually took her to a functional medicine physician who is not world renowned for her work on lupus. And she said, well, yeah, of course, what's causing her lupus is she has an extremely leaky gut. And she showed that she figured it out very quickly, showed with testing that that was what was going on, which the other doctors hadn't even looked at. And she said, look, we can heal this. She will improve. So she's now over 10 years out with no wow. lupus. She's done absolutely great. And this is the future for all of these chronic illnesses, be they autoimmune illnesses, as you indicated, people with MS, and Terry has had such great results uh, with MS, um, people with even certain cancers, you know, people with other chronic illnesses, and the neurodegenerative illnesses have been the big boogeyman, as you said before. These have been the thing we're all worried about. You get them, and life is over. There's nothing you can do. Well, that's changing. So we can now target this for here are the things that drive Parkinson's. We, can, we know something from the research about what drives the loss of the dopaminergic neurons in Parkinson's. We know something about what drives this in Lewy body disease. We know something about what drives it in frontotemporal. So we should be able now to attack all of these by having the basics plus the specific drivers, the targeting those things that we can now pick up with the appropriate lab tests. So I'm really enthusiastic that we have entered the era of treatable neurodegenerative illness and treatable chronic illness. Mm, that's such a great point. And thank you for adding in that clarification because we need both. We need the foundational and then these targeted hyper-personalized approaches right. or what that patient is uniquely dealing with. Dr. Dale Bredesen, this has been fantastic. And thank you so much. Drew. I want to thank you for really your incredible work. I got an early advanced copy of the book and I read the whole thing and went through it. And I just want to say, because so much of health and so much of people addressing these things and starting at home 
in the conjunction with the doctor is about behavior change. And that is about things being digestible, finding the motivation and the excitement through seeing other case studies that are out there, having practical tips. And you guys have done just such an incredible job of that in the book and laying out the foundational work and how people can personalize the approach of the end of Alzheimer's program. So congratulations for really putting out an incredible piece of work that has people continue the momentum that you've uh, built. Thanks so much, Drew. I really appreciate it. And you know, let's all work together. Let's make Alzheimer's a scourge of the past. Well, the book is out there. People can pick it up. They can pre-order it. They can buy it. You can find the link inside of the show notes. Uh, Dr. Bredesen, any, anywhere else that you'd like to send the listeners of this podcast who want to find out more about the work that, you wanna, that you're doing? Absolutely. So you can actually get a cognoscopy at mycognoscopy.com. Um, you can get more information at drbredesen.com as well. Uh, and uh, I say those, are, those are probably the two best places to go to get additional information. Well, I'll just conclude on this, on top of the acknowledgements that I shared, one more. Thank you for taking what is largely considered the scariest disease that people fear in the world and giving them a sense of hope, uh, not just in terms of what's coming down the road, but what's available to us today. And thanks very much for the great work you, that you do, getting, you know, getting the word out to people and having people live healthier. This is gonna make a huge impact on society. So thanks very much.